All right, we are live. Let's uh, wait a few minutes until uh, some people are joining. Uh, let's give it a few more minutes and then I'll uh, announce our nice speakers for tonight, Julian and Gonzalo. I'm Dave. I'm just, yeah, I'm just and, a backup, backup voice. Perfect. All uh, right, great. We have four viewers already. Um, I think all of you uh, who are tuning in on YouTube Live, there's like a big live chat box. So uh, it would be nice if you can uh, like surely, shortly introduce yourself, at least who you are and maybe also uh, where you come from, if you like, of course. And uh, in the meantime, before we really start, I actually have some uh, nice, good news, um, also related to the communities worldwide, and that's that we are, uh, this week we um, started uh, our presence in the 89th country, which is uh, Mongolia. So uh, pretty happy to, uh, to be present in that area as well. Not really sure if they can make it for this webinar, but uh, let's see. Who knows? And uh, also for the introduction, next to me at the other side of this table, we have uh, Rish. And Rish is also helping out with uh, the Q&A session later on. So uh, we have our global community manager of the Things Network present here as well. So uh, if you have any questions related to Rish, then uh, you are also free to ask it later on during this webinar. All right, let's wait a few more minutes. Let's say two more minutes and then we can uh, we can start. Uh, great, we have someone from India. Welcome, Ashish. Great having you around here. Well, it already makes us at least four different countries that are uh, that are active here on Hangouts. I'm basically I'm based in uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Gonzalo from Zurich in Switzerland, and Julian from Manchester in the UK. And uh, Rish, who is sitting next to me, is also from uh, from India in origin. So uh, quite some international crew we have here. Good. All right. Thank you all for joining. Um, maybe a few small things um, before we really start is that we have a, a, a nice live chat feature on the um, YouTube live so if you have any comments if you have any questions um, remarks or whatsoever please use this live chat um, and for the ones that are haven't done a live webinar your, uh, yourself, then it might be sometimes a bit strange because you're talking to a computer screen, not really to a uh, live audience. So it might be nice if you, at least if you have something to appreciate that you mention it in a live chat. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least we know that we are saying some good stuff along the way. Um, so this uh, will take about one hour. Um, both presentation, I think, will take around 50 minutes, and we have a, like a bigger Q and A session afterwards. Um, so my name is Laurens. Um, I'm together with Rish doing the community management for the Things Network. So like some of you might already be familiar with their names or faces. Uh, hello, Krishna. Welcome. Um, so let me announce the first speaker for tonight, which is uh, Julian. Um, actually one of our first community initiators lo uh, located in Manchester, UK. Um, yeah, so I think we are, you're one of the, the experts on the field of LoRa, on the thing, field of the Things Network. Um, and actually recently you uh, joined forces with a lot of local communities in the northern part of the UK. And uh, won a very good, uh, very nice award. And I think you will mention a bit more about it during the presentation. No, no, <laughs> not at all. And uh, otherwise, I'll ask you about it later on. <laughs> um, yeah, Julian, um, yeah, it's all yours. And, uh, okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Julian, and this is uh, my my colleague Dave from Manchester. 
Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to be able to speak to the rest of the community because often we only get to speak to um, uh, people in the UK. So this is this is this is a great opportunity. Um, what I'll do, I shall uh, start the the presentation, and hopefully it will work. Um, sometimes these things don't necessarily work. So wait a second. Uh, it's down there. Window full screen. Right. Right. Uh, can everybody see that? Oh, it actually just dropped again, your screen sharing. <laughs> <That's his laughs> I'll to do it again. And then, uh, in the meantime, while you're setting up this presentation, I'll, uh, I'll post the link of your community uh, community page of uh, the Things Network Community in Manchester. I put it in the, the live chat. So, uh, Right, OK. So um, can you see the, uh, the I'm going to screen share it now. Can you can you see the screen like that? Uh, I, I cannot see it yet. No. Yes, there was it for for. But it's, yeah, per, but it's I not, can see it now. Yeah, it's, see it now. So I, I won't go to full screen because I, I think uh, Google doesn't like Adobe, um, and I think that's obviously some bug in the system. So yes. Um, Hi, hi. Um, really great to uh, get a chance to talk to you. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we are, where we, where we come from. And I suppose myself and Dave have been working in IoT for quite a long time, and we've done some uh, pretty uh, bonkers um, IoT projects. Um, quite a lot of them to do with, um, I suppose, creative digital arts-based stuff. But but not um, not uniquely. Um, the picture you can see is a um, a pollution mapping um, project that we did in Manchester. We have lots of canals, not quite as nice as Venice or Amsterdam. Um, but they were. Uh, but what we were doing is we were we were putting uh, GPS units into balls and we're kind of mapping the flow through the canal system. Um, unfortunately. Uh, Loruan and the uh, Things Network wasn't available at that time, so um, it ended up being quite expensive because we had to spend lots of money on uh, on uh, SIM cards. But we've also been involved with kind of stuff around pollution sensing, and I suppose with a bit of historical context, um, involved in certain kind of civic and maker activities. Um, Dave was one of the um, was an originator of uh, Mad Lab in Manchester. I set up uh, Open Data Manchester, uh, which is a community that is about the reuse of data. And so there are kind of similar linkages with um, how we perceive things network here in Manchester. And also we've been involved with various pieces of, um, I suppose, uh, government research as to why the Internet of Things will and won't work. Um, I think what really uh, started to appeal with regards to the Things Network and why we were kind of very enthusiastic at, at, the, at the very beginning was this notion of the Things Network had a, a manifesto. Um, it didn't seem to be like other kind of technology projects, apart from maybe some of the kind of the open source projects. And I think this allowed us to, uh, to think more about what can you do if you make crowdsourced Internet of Things? How can you allow as many people as possible to to kind of engage with it? And also, because it's open and it's open access, you, you can actually probably make it more inclusive, uh, which was very, very attractive to us. And also, that kind of allowed, I suppose, us to think more in a kind of design kind of terms as to what, how useful um, a network such as uh, the Things Network would be. So we did lots of stuff around doing lots of events, uh, workshops. Um, these are some of the kind of um, the cartoons from from those. Um, as kind of what are the potential uses? How would people use it? We did these in Manchester. Um, there was one that was done. A colleague of ours who's worked worked with us at the start. She did a, a workshop at Transmediale in Berlin. 
And so I was trying to engage and try to speak to as many as many people as possible, really. Um, so the um, w the whole idea <laughs> we had, we were quite ambitious in in our kind of in, in our vision, I suppose. And we kind of thought about this this idea of what is the city. So Manchester is two point eight million people, so it's quite large, um, and it covers a an area roughly the size of of, of London. But I, but we worked out using or building the things network, we could potentially cover the whole region with thirty gateways. So we set ourselves the task of how can we um, build an infrastructure from the Pennines. So we've got quite high hills on one side of Manchester to the Cheshire Plain, which is kind of out towards the sea. So it's like, how can we occupy this space? How can we how can we kind of put a flag down um, saying that uh, Laura One this technology should be for for community and public benefit before it became, uh, I suppose, swamped, privatised and commodified, uh, yeah. uh, commercially operated space. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's this kind. Of, we can use this for, for public good. So that was the kind of that was kind of the that was the kind of vision. Um, so a lot of a lot of the stuff we did early on was around um, building the community and advocacy. So um, there's a guy actually on the. Um, on the left of the picture called Jonathan who's uh, from Amsterdam so we've got quite so we, we were over in Amsterdam quite a lot and, and obviously we were just kind of um, bored by the stuff that you were doing so Jonathan came over spoke to a, a, a workshop we run monthly events uh, for people to kind of get to know the technology and we've, we've kind of done we've, we have uh, both myself and Dave have spoken all over the country and on a couple of occasions internationally if you call the Isle of Man International, um, and, and to kind of kind of encourage people to kind of become part of it. I mean, and these things have been kind of academic events. They've been, um, I suppose, industry events. Yeah, community kind of engagement and uh, kind of propagation events. Yes. So a lot. So a lot about kind of leveraging, leveraging the network, um, the, the networks that we had through the, the other activities that we've done. And, and the advantage of doing something like this is that it, it it creates you end up having a kind of conversations with people who you would never usually have, who have conversations with. So we're not actually um, so we're not selling anything. Well, we're selling an idea. So we're trying to encourage people to um, to kind of put equipment on 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 their on their uh, assets. And one of the Earlier conversation, the earliest conversations that we had were with people such as the, the fire service in Greater Manchester, who kind of really liked the idea that you could you could start to build something that had public good. Um, but that's just not uniquely. I mean, through these conversations, through talking to lots of people, going out there, um, uh, we kind of we had people who kind of businesses who kind of were interested in in putting stuff up. And even even residential properties, and, and we kind of went down the 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 the, the approach of how well how can we make something? Um, there's a photo in the middle of the slide that, that shows this kind of a unit that you could fit onto the outside of a house that will basically uh, manage the internet connection for you. Um, and how can we make this kind of very easy to install for kind of people who who wanted to take part but wouldn't necessarily. Um, want have any idea of what the technology did so so it's kind of so we're looking at kind of doing things using all kinds of uh, ways of, of putting the infrastructure up um, and also we did things like tech for good events and and, and stuff like, and stuff like that so what was what was done so it so allowed us to build the network rel relatively quickly um but one of the one of the things that we did have was we, we did need to do was kind of prove the worth of the um, the network by building stuff on it. Um, it's it's one thing having a network, but it it doesn't mean anything unless people are actually doing anything with it. So working with the fire service, um, we commissioned um, a guy who's who's in Oldham to kind of develop, um, which is in which is in Manchester, um, a smoke alarm just as just as a proof of concept to show that. Actually, you can start doing interesting stuff relatively inexpensively. I think, yeah, the value was that it, it took something, that, you know, describing why you would have this this uh, Internet of Things network and this public, uh, publicly available network is quite intangible. People don't really get what you're talking about. They don't understand 
you know, what this is trying to do that you can't already do with like a mobile phone SIM card. So developing these particular examples gives you something you can talk about, you can physically point to, and kind of embody the idea of, of, of what the whole network is about. Uh, as well as its kind of public benefits, and, and I think I think what the what they they did like <clears throat> in particular was this idea that you could start developing things really cheaply and quickly without how what government bodies tend to do is they tend to go through very long procurement processes to get anywhere, and obviously that makes them not um, not willing to do that. So is this kind of very very low cost, very very quick, very cheap? Does an idea work? Yes good does it not work okay we'll move on to the next thing so so that's what things network is kind of allowing people to do and that's what we're trying to promote anyway so um i mean we've been as i said we've been talking to anyone and everyone um and I, and i think that um this is a map that was been developed by the people over in leeds um a guy called um stuart stuart low um and this is something that I mean, if you ask him, he, he can make it available to any. He's, he's, he's made it available to a, to a few communities. So we have GPS range finders, and we can go around and and kind of measure the the, the coverage. Um, and what we found is ori originally we, were, we kind of thought that the, perhaps we would have um, really real problems with range. Um, but actually, what we found was some of the range was 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 massive, even in a kind of urban, semi-urban environment. So, um, from one of the kind of antennas that's on top of a house, you can reach about ten miles into the hills. I mean, uh, twelve kilometres, or or down to we've got we've got quite a big airport, or you can you can pick it pick the pick the gateway up at the airport. So, we're really kind of impressed with that. But as you see on the map. We, this, these are all point point readings, and it's kind of um, it takes a lot of time to map an entire city, and especially as new gateways come on, that's, that's that'll take it, that'll take you that'll take even longer. Um, a main, an, another major thing that we, we do is kind of we try and train people to do stuff, and and try and show them that technology needn't be threatening. So. I mean, and that's that's kind of, and I suppose this is the true nature of how how the open source movement works. Really, is it's kind of if we know something, we'll share it. If you know something, we'll learn off you. And so we kind of we do our, do our best to try and enable people to kind of understand the technology, implement it themselves. Although what we found is that we ta we teach people how to do stuff, and then they then tell us to go and do it for them, which is kind of not quite how it's supposed to work, but. Um, that seems, seems to be how it happens, um, but but you end up working or, or talking to people about some incredibly interesting projects. So we were working with some people who um, who were interested in measuring temperature. They ran a mushroom farm, and humidity and temperature is really important, as so in, and as so is light and UV light. So it's kind of working. How can they use? How can they use these technologies to enable them to kind of remotely monitor their their mushroom crop? And also, there was, there was um, there's a project that was that was suggested um, measuring the the health of bees through the sound and temperature of the hives. Um, although that project hasn't hasn't gone gone ahead as of yet. But these conversations lead to um, to many interesting project ideas. And obviously certain people then go and take them up um what we also noticed or what we, we were very aware of very early on is that especially when we're, we're working with public bodies is that we need to professionalize what we did um so a lot of the equipment we use is kind of off off the shelf so we use a lot of curlink gateways primarily because um people like the fire service or one of the universities who put um a gateway on and, and one of the local authorities count one of the government bodies um, specified that everything had to be certified and so we have to go through this whole process of doing risk assessing and stuff like this so this is an exercise that that Dave and myself did which was basically looking at all the kind of the attack vectors that, that could happen on the network we, we needed to do this because um, some of the gateways that we had were attacked by brute force um, we used uh, a number of the gateways are on um, on use mobile mobile networks, GPRS, and what we found is um, 
stupidly we put them up as as public ips and as soon as you do that you you get attacked and because you're liable for every, every, all the traffic that worked that cost a lot of money there's a dvr botnet tuck us out <laughs> yeah yeah there's a, there's a botnet in uh, in korea tuck us out <laughs> so, that was, so we thought we better start <laughs> Start getting a, getting a stuff together really really quickly. So so this is this so so this is part of the the whole learning and and we learn off other we learn off other people's mistakes and hopefully other people learn off our mistakes as well because we've we've had a few mistakes but that's part of the learning the learning process. Um so yeah coming to this kind of the communities in in the north of the UK so um if you if you ever in Manchester do come to Manchester uh, be our guests use the network that's what it's all there for. Um, it's, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a railway station that has this old map from the 19, 1920s, uh, which shows this kind of the, the railway line that, that ran all the way from Hull in the east through to um, Liverpool in the west. And actually, this is a major corridor, and this is quite what's quite interesting. Communities have started to set up uh, almost along this corridor from Hull to Liverpool. All doing, all doing their stuff. All, all doing some really, really fascinating stuff in Hull. They're doing lots of stuff with with uh, young people in education, in Leeds and Bradford. They're doing, doing and in Calderdale, they're doing stuff around flooding and other stuff. In Liverpool, um, they're just building stuff. I don't know <laughs> what they're building, but that's what it's all about. And and so we kind of thought, well, we're all in the north. Why don't we kind of band together? And that's where we kind of came, to, thought about, um, well. <coughs> let's let's put an award let's 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 go in to this this industry award as a um i suppose a collective and uh we won yay yeah. um but, but the thing was it was the award wasn't just about people in the, the the communities in the north it was about everybody and it's almost like a validation of what we have all been doing as things network communities and so it, it's kind of although it would be quite expensive to, to kind of ship the award around everywhere but if he wants to wants to pay for the shipping, that's fine. Um, the um, it, it is there for for all of us, and it, and it does kind of um, validate what uh, what we're doing. Um, finally, um, the um, as far as the, the stuff that we're doing, especially with regards to all the, the northern communities, we're organising a uh, a couple of things network days at Wuthering Bikes, which is a fantastic. Uh, festival that's organised by Andrew Back, who is the person who heads up uh, things Calderdale, um, on the third and fourth of September. It's a ten-day-long festival of, of open hardware, open source hacking, whatever. It's in the hills. It's a beautiful place. It's not a city. It's in the hills. It's in a, it's in a small town. Very very hospitable. Great place to go. So on the third and fourth of September, we're doing a a building on building on the Things Network uh, using uh, microchip SODAP boards. Um, which we can have for free, and also we're doing a, a kind of a bigger conference. So if you want to know more about that, um, let us know. Um, type in Wuthering Bites into your favourite search engine um, and uh, find out more about it. And yes, I think that is us. Cool. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, very nice event as far as i heard it the withering bites i just shared a link of it on the, the live chat channel um yeah thanks for the presentation uh, again congratulations with uh, with the rewards well deserved that's right uh, that's everybody should all clap each yeah, other yeah, yeah. <laughs> clap emoji in the yeah, chat. Great work. all right uh, we have time for let's say uh, like one or two questions and then i suggest we move on to gonzalo and then at the end of the session we can have uh, like a few uh, longer q a parts so if any uh, one has a question feel, feel free to put it in the live chat um and for now actually you already mentioned it um that you uh, know yeah you were one of the first communities so you made quite some mistakes i'm uh, pretty curious like, what is the thing you highly recommend others not to do don't put anything on a public IP address without a VPN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just get found. Particularly if you're paying the bills. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that was that was such a, a costly. We we were we were kind of forced into the route of, of going down that way through um, the uh, some of the people who wanted um, antennas on the on their buildings. Because they, 
And what you find with public bodies, they will not generally not allow you to connect into their IT systems. Sysadmins are the, they will just, they'll think of every reason why you cannot connect to Gateway. And so um, using uh, SIM cards, GPRS was an obvious solution. But we, th we thought the devices were kind of well protected. We thought we'd lock the security down and we did have, you know, devices well configured. There were no inbound ports other than SSH running on very non-standard ports. So, you know, even kind of pretty stupid botnets shouldn't have hit them. What we didn't consider was that you pay for the traffic costs before you can reject those packets. And that's a cost that particularly hits you with the uh, 3G based networks. Uh, so that's a very value we'd like to share uh, our expensive lesson. Yeah, and I, I think we should, I, I think we shared we shared that before, but yes, I mean if, if we because we were using because the great thing about LoRaWAN is that it you you don't the throughput of traffic isn't that big, but when you've got forty nine gigabytes of traffic going through uh, one gateway. But someone's video recorder every two minutes. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. Someone's room full of video recorders is uh, checking you out every two minutes. Yeah. It's uh, quite pricey. Yeah, it is. So, yes. All right. Good. So, be careful with public IP addresses. And, uh, yes, don't. <laughs> don't. Good. Use proper VPN or GPRS solutions. All right. Good. Good. Um, all right. I, I, I'm pretty curious about. Oh, let me have one more question and then uh, let's let's move on. So you mentioned that the uh, the mushroom crops monitoring, yes, uh, which, which sounds to me quite a uh, like an easy solution for like, getting started. You mentioned like um, like trying to get really started with these tangible solutions um, for making yes. more IT more more tangible. So that, how does that work? How can I how can I make one myself? Well, we've got one. No, we don't have one right here. I mean, you know, things like this are very simple. There's a lot of very simple uh, sensors. You know, light sensors are kind of next to nothing these days. Uh, yeah. But, um, uh, moisture level sensors are very, very easy to whip up. So they're things you can sit. You've probably got kind of old Arduinos kicking around. You can wire this sort of thing together on. In terms of reading the sensors, it's it's very trivial work. Uh, and then it's just a matter of bridging across to a lower one gateway. And what we've also done is we found that uh, working with Node Red is is kind of revelatory. Uh, for people because it's a great way of processing uh, yeah. data pulling data off and people are not intimidated by that so we found one of the ways you know one of the barriers is people kind of often come to this and think mm -hmm. they're going to be terrified of uh, you know this world of suddenly having to get into C or assembler programming to kind of manage and work with data mm -hmm. as soon as we show them node red that applies by you know how easy it is to, to get to that sort of thing yeah so we found that's a kind of a really really good way um, to kind of uh, take the fear away for people. So there's a lot of very simple tools, kind of old Arduinos, lots of old off the shelf um, hardware and software that you can work with. And then gluing things together with Node-RED is a really quick way to kind of um, get that stuff processing. Yeah, and, 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 a lot of, and a lot of boards now do have light and um, humidity, temperature and humidity sensors on them. So it's almost like, <laughs> guys, look, this, this will cost you 15 euros. Um, and it works. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is program the keys. It's, it's, it's just like that. And also, I mean, what was what was really good about the, the guy? We would, so we did the mushroom hack um, project, and actually, the guy lived it somewhere else where there's another another uh, things community. So it's kind of we just put him in touch with that community and said, speak to these guys. If you when you, when you build it, discuss it with them. Build it. You can connect it over there. You bring in mushrooms here if you want, but you live over there, kind you of. You don't thing. even need to tell them. You can just use the network. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. Good use case. So you just need temperature, light, a bit of humidity, connected to the things network. Use Node-RED. Very easy drag and drop platform. I uh, wow. used quite some uh, a bit with it as well. And uh, you just make sure you get a gateway or be somewhere in range. And uh, yeah, it's a good start. Definitely. Good. Um, yeah, Julian, Dave, thanks a lot. We'll get back to you a bit later after uh, Gonzalo's presentation. Um, so, Gonzalo, Hello. welcome. Yeah. Um, as well, one of our first initiators, and uh, I think we're most one of our most active contributors uh, on the community level, but also um, 
yeah, many issues, uh, pull requests you already submitted on uh, on the Things Network, on our back end, on, on whatsoever. So I'm um, very happy to have you here as well. Um, I think, um, well, I think I'm more or less sure that Zurich has now most of the gateways, uh, more gateways than any other community in the world. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear your story about how you, uh, how you created this, realized this. Um, and there are many other things I can talk about, uh, like the, the great hackathon you organized, uh, the nonprofit foundations you set up. Um, I guess like some of it will be covered in your presentation. So uh, please go. Okay. So well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, great job, guys in Manchester. I love what you're doing. There's a lot of parallels between between you and you and us. Um, but first, let me share my screen. Okay, is it working? Yeah, working fine. Great. Okay, so um, I'll start from the beginning. You know, as, as most other communities, we we started with the with the local meetup group um, back in 2015 in August, like very soon after the Things Network was was public. And um, uh, immediately, as soon as we started putting up some gateways, like the first couple of gateways were were on, and we we saw how the community was ramping up. The the engagement was instantaneous once there was something in there. Um, and then, well, the, the the meetups intensified. We started meeting more often and more meaningfully, and. Uh, meetups are still the center of the of our community. We we notice that every time immediately after a meetup, there is a peak of activity of every of all kind. People start doing things, playing with the uh, playing with toys and and all that. Uh, but you know most of that already. And um, so this is this is Zurich. There's there's a lot of gateways. Other there. Is, the city is like, relatively well covered, and at some point late, uh, last year, we we ask ourselves like, so now what, right? So, <clears throat> what what we did was um, was try to we we try to make it sustainable. Basically, we founded an association, a non-profit association, which in in Switzerland is extremely easy. I believe in 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 the Netherlands is the same. Um, you just have to get together with a few people, write as articles of association, and you're good to go. You don't need to register or anything. So the um, the purpose of this associ association is is generally to build trust in open networks. Also, our our um, one of the one of the key element uh, or concepts here is that the association is not a replacement of the community at all it's a support for the community it's an instrument to ensure that the community is sustainable and it also breaches the community with the rest of the world because we noticed that it was very hard for the community which is a like loosely coupled uh, set of people uh, it was very hard to engage with their the corporations and, and companies everywhere because you cannot even invoice them and things like very simple things like that. Um, another another um, driving pr principle of what we're doing in the association is basically spreading the word. So we're organizing events, uh, workshops, hackathons, and uh, yeah, all sort of stuff. And we're also trying to ensure the legal framework stays uh, as regulate regulation free as possible, the, or at least the, the regulatory overhead is as low as possible. Um, and in in very very general terms, what we are aiming to do with this concept of building trust, because that it's it's not entirely clear what an open network is or what 
what we're trying to define as an open source network, in fact. Um, uh, an open source network is is a is a relatively new concept in a way. It's it's not only built on top of open source, but it's operated uh, as following the open definition, basically, in many regards. It's, um, but it's, there's still very little trust from the from the business work in this model. Yeah. And our um, our our idea is, or our thesis the hypothesis is that we are going to go more or less the same way that the open source software went. Like if you think about what was like twenty years ago or so, uh, open source software was also not very trustworthy. Like Microsoft famously said that Linux was a cancer that had to be eradicated. Um, and now, if you if you look at the state of the world, open source runs the basically the entire internet, and there is more trust in open source than in closed source software. The same thing is not there yet for networks, but we're trying to 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 establish that kind of trust. Basically, teaching the or showing the the world that a, a network that it's not centrally operated by a corporation is more or can be more stable sta uh, more stable more reliable than a than a commercial operation so in concrete terms what are we doing or what have we done so far with the association there are three projects that we focus on last year since we since we started one was the um, the hackathon that uh, Lawrence mentioned um, the other one is deploying the the things network backend for switzerland and uh, okay. the last one is basically facilitating gateway hosting and procurement and all these things to anyone here that wants to do it so go into details the the hackathon was probably the most time consuming project we had um, the idea of the hackathon that was called make zurich was to bring together the, the people from the city administration and uh, the maker and, and the maker community in general and uh, it we well it took it took a, a lot of uh, effort to organize but the end result was was very satisfying I think everyone was very, was very happy with it we were very happy with it especially. <laughs> And the, the format we chose for the event was uh, was also a longer event, like like you guys in Manchester are planning. It was it started with a kickoff event on a Friday night. Then it was followed by an open lab week. So the entire week was open for for lab experimentations. That we had a we we rented the one of the fab labs in the in the city, and then we the next weekend or Friday and Saturday, we we got together for a two day more intense hackathon session. We had like 70 people participating, 17 projects that actually made it till the end and presented. The, the hackathon was not competitive in nature, so it was cooperative. The idea was to share knowledge and build upon what others know. And, and help, help each other and, and basically have a lot of fun. Uh, we had Vinca visiting, which was amazing. And we also got a lot of exposure after that. Then we were featured in the main newspapers in, in the country. And yeah, we, we started getting calls from, from all sort of uh, different sources that wanted to do things or know more about the things that work. Um, one thing, like one lesson from the from organizing this hackathon, we, we one of the ideas was to open source the event itself, um, which we are still working on how to exactly. But we did publish a very long report on on everything that we did 
towards the event, how we planned several things. There is a link at the end of the this this presentation, and well, it, it, in any case, it's in GitHub, so you can find it. Um, and one of the lessons we learned was that sponsoring, like getting money for these kind of events, is is actually way easier than what you might expect. We during the early planning phase, or yeah, when when we had the location set and we were ramping up the the organization, uh, the the guys from the city say that maybe you can suggested us to like, see if we could find sponsors on, on our side, and we weren't very sure how to do it even. But um, we started getting in touch with hardware companies, and they were all very positive. Many of them agreed to to sponsor, like almost no questions asked. Yeah, what you're doing is great. I want to, I want to be part of it. So in the end, it was it was pretty easy to get sponsorship for the for the event. The the other project we've been working on together with with the guys in Amsterdam, actually, with Johan and, and Eric, um, is setting up a Swiss zone, you know, the, a, the set, set up the backend of the Things Network to run in Switzerland. There are there are a few reasons why we want to do it. It's, um, on, on one hand, it's a technical reason. We If we are closer, latency is lower, like, all things will should work better, um, but there is a legal reason which is probably stronger, and it's we are in Switzerland. We're we're not Europe, <laughs> so we have different uh, data protection laws. That means that if we can keep the data in country, the legal jurisdiction is within the country. So we have a, at least potentially less. Um, Exposure to lawful interception and all sort of all, all, all of these things. Um, and the another reason was generally network sustainability. If we if we manage to have this distributed setup, we, and it's if we, if we prove that it's possible to set up a distributed backend for the things network, then others other communities might do it as well. And decentralization will make the network stronger. It will it will remove single point of failures, and it will yeah it will generally make it better for everyone. The the other project we have running, yeah, but it's a bit looser in the definition. Is we try to facilitate gateways, like how to host a gateway, basically. Because we we have a lot of or we see in a lot of companies, local companies, that um, they want to do this, they want to host a gateway, for example, but they don't have the the they don't have enough energy to actually pull through and do it. They would, you know, they, maybe they go to a meetup and they say, yeah, that, that's a very nice idea, but then they don't move forward. And if we help them, then things actually happen. We we help them with the with the ordering process. We we try to explain how to how to host the gateway, basically. Well, the things that they need to take care of, uh, like as you say, not putting it with a public IP address <laughs> and this this sort of things. Um, yeah. So maybe some like, random tips on how we run the association. I know that this is this cannot be generalized because every country is different, but some of the things that are general is uh, you will want to automate as much as possible and this in this day and of the century this is pretty easy to do. So for to reduce the administration overhead we try to use as many automated tools as possible. So we use Invoice Ninja for invoicing the, the membership fees and Zapier to connect Mailchimp and these things and Typeforms. And, you know, there's plenty of tools out there that uh, allow to, to basically have the 
association running on its own mostly. Um, I something we we kind of decided since the beginning on how to conceptually run our finances was to focus on per project sponsoring, not on getting money from the members. So uh, our membership fee is, is just symbolic. Uh, there is it's very little money, and it's it's only for a, a, a pragmatic uh, membership management thing because. Um, here in Switzerland, you need to have certain quorum if you want to make a change. So if you have free membership, you might not have enough quorum if the members are not active anymore. So we have just a symbolic amount. And if we need money for a project, then we'll just build up enough, uh, enough documentation on the project. We will actually prepare a, a sponsorship pack, a sponsoring package for that kind of project, which in retrospect is actually very obvious because people are way more uh, likely to give you money if they know what it will be used for. It's not the same if you go to a company and say, yeah, why don't you subscribe or why don't you become a member of our association than uh, saying that like, we need X amount of money and we'll do Y. You know, we'll do X project or, or Y project, and, and that is that works very well. And this this is what we've seen with the Make Make Zurich Hackathon, basically. Um, and then one last thing, like for the, we try to be open source by default in the operation of the association as well. So documents like um, articles of our association are open source. Um, there are some reports. I mean, we haven't produced a lot of documentation so far, but we, whatever we do produce, we try to make it open source so that if another um, if another community wants to replicate what we're doing, they can basically fork a repository and and get yeah get kick started easy, easily. Um, yeah. So what's next for us? We're always trying to define what's next, but uh, one of the what well, we will keep doing hackathons. That's almost for sure. We will um, almost for sure have a Make Zurich 2018 edition. Uh, we're working on on other hackathons together with the city and different communities like Open Data in Switzerland and. We're also working on network monitoring and alerting for our local gateway operators because they, that's one of the complaints they have is they, they take the task, like they basically operate the gateway, but they don't really have the time to go and look at what's the status of, they would like a, some sort of solution for that so that they get alerted. And the other thing we're trying to establish uh, as a as a functioning modus operandi of the association is to to create working groups that are focused, like task forces for certain things. This is something relatively new, so we're we're just starting to experiment with this idea. Um, but the goal is to distribute the um, the activities of the association in, in more and more members. So yeah, I think that's that's it. Bunch of links. And yeah. Cool. That's basically yeah. well thanks a lot for your presentation. Thanks a uh, always, always very happy to uh, to, to hear all the things you're uh, you're doing in Switzerland. Um, Really like the parts. And actually, my first question is uh, actually, I like a lot of parts about your presentation. Uh, I, I definitely see that like you mentioned like the gateway facilitation to make the threshold a little bit lower for people to get involved and to like start like purchasing or building these gateways it really helps. That's what we are seeing in Amsterdam as well. Mm -hmm. um, let me have a look. I like the part where you mentioned, like where you uh, like put the comparison between like these decentralized networks and the open source software. 
Um, yeah, that like it, it starts from uh, well, it needs to grow uh, and starts to like it needs to become become more familiar and more maybe general that people uh, like trust it to uh, to start using with it. Um, like, what do you what do you suggest about how we going how we getting there? But that obviously takes time. How can we uh, like? Is there any way where we can accelerate this process where we can still yeah convince people that this is a very reliable way of uh, yeah of using these kind of networking? Yeah, uh, I don't know exactly how to accelerate it, but I think we need to be transparent about how the network behaves. So we need to start exposing more metrics, like uptime metrics, make make public dashboards about the, the stability of the network. Um, and ideally running running open open data projects on top of it would make it very visible, very tangible, because it's not so exciting to watch a dashboard saying that this gateway was I don't know, 98 percent of time uh, then for example watching having one of these uh with this crowdsourced data project or maps that show data and then you actually see that the network is behaving that you can you can have like full city data of whatever like uh, like this project loof that in that info for instance that they collect fine particle um data uh, something like that with the things network would be great or the safe cast project these things that uh, expose the the value of the network very transparently point, point, yeah, point. so uh, yeah closing development the network i think that's what you can also be talked about earlier on uh, yeah, and being transparent about like where where's the coverage like we have a very good tool for that the ttm ever Mm -hmm. uh, um, like yeah, showcasing uptime, etc. Yeah. And let's see if there are any uh, questions or uh, or comments uh, somewhere already. And uh, like, if any has anyone has any question or comment, then uh, please post them in the the live chat channel. Um, actually, I'm already having uh, quite a while uh, the the idea to uh, host a very very good and big hackathon here in Amsterdam as well, where we try to get in, like as many communities worldwide involved as possible. So uh, that is something we will be organizing cool. uh, a bit later on this year. So uh, we'll get more updates on the field later on. Um, yeah, maybe like Zalo for newly starting communities, do you have some, some easy tips how you can get forward? If you have a few gateways in place, Small group of, of community members. What's the next step to like get this more reliability on the network? Or maybe Julian, maybe you have some ideas about this as well. Yeah, I've just got a question for Gonzalo, if that's all right. <laughs> this is great. Sure. I just, I'm just amazed by the by the stuff that you do. Are you uh, working with any kind of activist groups at all? So within within Manchester, we have. I mean, like most cities, this pollution is is a, is a problem, and the um, the kind of cycle activists are very into kind of deploying sensors so that they can then go to the city and say, "Look, you need to sort this out. This is this is unhealthy." So, so, so it almost like the technology starts to get used for um, civic activism. Have you have, have you found that happening in Zurich? Um, not entirely. The I think the the closest to that would be the open data community that is very involved, uh, but it doesn't have a specific uh, agenda that they follow except open data in general. Yeah, so we don't have a the um, a more focused group that is involved right now, but it would be good, of course. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> One more question that I uh, that I had around fundraising, uh, because you started like asking for fees to join the association. You mentioned it's kind of a symbolic amount. Mm -hmm. um, like, do we see any? What what's the response of the community on this? Um, 
we we made it very transparent. We voted on what was going to be the amount when we when we founded the association, and we just chose a, a geeky funny number. I mean, we wanted to go for forty two, but it was too expensive. So then we we went for twenty three francs a year, uh, which is is nothing. It's like the cost of a pizza a year, um, and it was be also because we were twenty three founding members on that on mm. that meeting. But it was really just kind of a joke. At some point, we said let's let's do one franc a year, but then we I don't know. <laughs> one didn't didn't wasn't exciting enough, wasn't funny enough. Nice. But, uh, yeah, everyone perceives it as a uh, like no money, so it's a uh, it's not um, yeah it's not considered expensive. Or anything. And we're also accepting Bitcoin payment, which is also cool for our community. <laughs> uh, with that's also a good thing that with this with these tools that I mentioned, it's very easy to set up all this. So the whole thing is automated. Fits quite well with the decentralized uh, infrastructure. So uh, yeah. nice. All right, perfect. Um, like I think we are nearing towards uh, nine o'clock, so we almost uh, hit the hour on this. Is there anything you uh, still like to to mention, Gonzalo or Julian, to uh, like to the community members tuning in or listening later on to this recording? Um, I'm. I mean, I'm really following on from what Gonzalo uh, talked about. Um, really interested in how do you make uh, sustainable structures for things network communities I'm very interested in the uh, the open infrastructure association because it's because we're looking because here we're looking at similar models it's kind of because you can't have the network resting on the big you can't have a few individuals being responsible for a whole network it has to be truly decentralized mm -hmm. so we're like kind of looking at a, a cooperative kind of structures where everybody owns everything I'm trying to get a diversity into that and it's I think that is a really key thing for, for communities that, that, that are wanting to scale that I, I don't and I'd love to kind of have further, would love to have further conversations with regards to that yeah it would be great yeah. yeah I think actually if I uh, like speak here in in uh, from Amsterdam um, I think you always have to deal with a, a relatively small core team that's um, like doing most of the work and trying to like involve all of the community, organize the meetups, checking in on gateway owners if there's an issue or if, if the gateway is offline. So I think you always have maybe a group of, I don't know what's, what's done in your case, maybe like three people that are like the most active in the community. and. Um, and yeah, I think what you mentioned, Gonzalo, as well, like uh, these meetups, those are like very efficient. And um, what I see as well that after every meetup, there's like a, a lot of enthusiasm, people like getting back to us with new ideas, yeah. uh, asking around if they can do a demo or a presentation the next meetup. So that, that's really an important where, where everything comes together and there's a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely one of the reasons to. Uh, uh, yeah, to make I think the whole community a bit more sustainable. Anything you'd like to, to add to this, Gonzalo? Uh, no, I mean I just want to congratulate you guys in Manchester. I I love what you're doing as well. It's really cool. Um, no, we would. <laughs> Same here. World too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just come up to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. Let's uh, round off this, uh, this webinar for now. Thank you all for uh, for listening, and thank you, uh, Julian and Gonzalo, for giving uh, this very good okay. presentations. Um, so it will be recorded and put on uh, YouTube later on. Um, mm -hmm. so if any one of you wants to uh, re-listen it or missed part of the beginning or the end, then uh, it's always available. So um, thanks again, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. All right. Thank you very much. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.